Uh, my name's John Crew. I'm the vehicle director here at Cloud Imperium Games. And uh, my name is Ben Curtis. I am the vehicle art director at CIG. So we're going to spend the next 40, 45 minutes talking ship. Uh, we're going to show you some cool stuff that you've hopefully seen, some cool stuff that you're not supposed to have seen, but you probably already have, uh, and some cool stuff, again, you're not supposed to have seen, but what you've seen is wrong. So hopefully we can uh, clear that up for you all. Right, so that was the A1 Spirit trailer. Pretty cool video. Um, but we're now going to do a bit of a slightly deeper dive into the actual art and visuals of the ship. As we move into the heart of the ship, this area is kind of like really dominated by those 10 sci-fi bombs. And then we go straight into engineering where you find the rest of the ship components that it needs. Up front, we've got a completely fully featured habitation area, suit lockers, weapon lockers, pod beds, everything you're going to need. And then right at the cockpit, we have a two pilot cockpit and I think the Crusader engineers have done a fantastic job of putting everything that the pilot needs right at their fingertips. So you know, in the heat of battle, you kind of might just eke out that advantage. Exterior-wise, it's classic Crusader. We've got our recessed weapons. We've got our rear-mounted uh, remote turret. And then underneath is all business. We've got the missile racks and we've got the big bomb bays. And I think overall, you know, Crusader have done it again. They've done an you know, amazing job of packaging something that's like super feature rich and something stylish, sleek, looks fast, but still super aggressive. And then here is one last look. Oh, why not? Okay, that was one last look of the interior. Trigger there. Uh, so we had a really cool cutaway that you half saw. I'm sure we can show you that again later. Um, if you like what you saw there, that is available now on that link and a QR code there that hopefully takes you to the right place. Um, so that is available in Alpha 321, which went live Thursday. I've honestly lost track of time the last few days. Uh, so yeah, that's the current. Let's talk about something a bit further in the past. So we have a timeline here from the uh, today all the way through to today in, in game. And throughout that time period, we have our manufacturers in law, starting with RSI in the very near future, uh, going all the way through uh, to Mirai, which is this year in game. And over that, we have some very old ships, people, ships that people think are quite old. Uh, we have the Hornet, we have the Aurora, and we have the Gladius. However, as you can see, there is quite a gap from the current day to these old ships. Uh, so let's talk about one that is a bit older than that. So, the RSI Zeus. So, in 2130, hold on. In 2130, uh, RSI made some major kind of advancements in quantum technology. They developed, or they released, the first ship that was kind of available to the mass market that had quantum capability. This kind of mid-range explorer uh, really put RSI at the kind of forefront of ship development. Now, it was a really good thing. You know, it really kind of boosted them as a company, but that doesn't, it wasn't kind of all good. The original RSI Zeus had some major issues with its whole integrity. That being said, there's always kind of been this uh, demand for RSI to release the Zeus. It's kind of had this cult following that's grown up over the years. I'm kind of very happy to announce today that RSI have kind of taken that challenge on board. Um, they've developed a whole new vehicle that 
is designed to ferry a whole new generation of travelers across our universe. Visually, it's something that pays homage back to the original Zeus and something that's really uh, is, is justified to have that, that name. And I'm even happier to say it exceeds all current safety standards and all our current ship production techniques. So, do you want to have a look at the all new RSI Zeus Mark II? Yeah. Okay then. Here it is. So, uh, we are going to hand over to Elwyn and Mark to go through this. And you can see there's three of them there. So, we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive onto these three ships now. So, over to Mark and Elwyn. Oh. Let's give them a welcome. Come on, let's go, let's go. Hi there, everyone. My name is Mark Gibson. I'm the lead vehicle content designer at Cloud Imperium Games. <laughs> and I'm Owen Bachelor, Vehicle Art Director in North America. What do you guys think? Awesome. All right, well, let's take some time now and take a look at this classic RSI design and see how we've reimagined it. So when we decided we wanted to tackle the Zeus, we had to consider what direction RSI would take it in if they were going to do it today. We couldn't just remake the original Zeus because although it was obviously a massive piece of history, all it was really used for was transporting and moving around. So we had to consider exactly what we wanted to do with the ship. In the end, we decided to go for three variants, allowing you to pick which way you want to actually play the game. So what we're going to do is talk about those variants that we decided on in the end and go into a bit more detail with them. First of all, we have the ES. The ES is the essential. It's the long-range exploration version of the Zeus. It's designed to let you go out for a long time and explore the universe. Next up, we have the Mark. The Mark is the bounty hunter version. This is there for you so you can actually go out, find your targets, and bring them back. It's also been purposely outfitted so that you have all the tools that you need to disable, capture, and bring them home. Finally, the last version we're going to talk about is the CL, the Clipper. Might be a name people are familiar with if they know much about Maritime. This is the cargo version of the Zeus Mark II. This is designed so that you can move your goods around the universe. Of the three variants, the Zeus Essential is the one that harkens back the most to the original design with the original white on black paint job and the vertical stabilizers. We also worked to maintain the silhouette of the original, but brought that forward to modern day RSI design with tons of technical detail and layered panels. And on the underside, the landing gear and the underslung turret, as well as the entr entrance ladder, fold in perfectly flush, leaving behind a super smooth underbelly, just like the original design. But you probably all want to see what the inside looks like. So let's have a closer look. Despite the sleek and slim body of the Zeus, we've been able to pack a lot into it to give everything you need when you're doing the deep space exploration. You have a fairly comfortable habitation recreation area so that when you're out away from home, it's not too unpleasant. In addition to that, the rear room has a 32 SU cargo capacity as well as being able to fit a cyclone. So if you do decide to land our planet, you can have a look around. Talking about the loadout, it's a ship designed for three crew. It comes with four size two shield generators, two size two power plants, two size two coolers, and two size four pilot controlled weapons. And obviously the lower turret that Elwin mentioned earlier is a size three remote turret. Now the Zeus Mark was always designed from the beginning to be a sleek and aggressive bounty hunter. As such, the black paint will help you stay hidden in the shadows until you're ready to strike We've also redesigned the spine in order to embed an EMP and a quantum dampener, which allows us on the art side to really crank up the level of detail on the exterior. We've also added a second remote turret on the top. Looking at the interior of the mark, you see that the habitation's taken a little bit of a hit. It moved forward, but what we've been able to add in exchange for that is a massive armory that lets you take all the different weapons and equipment you might need while you're tracking your target along the verse. 
Looking into the rear, we actually have a dedicated area just for the actual um, Bounty Hunter pods, similar to what you'll see in the Cutlass Blue. So you can stack up the pods and take multiple people back with you. It has less SU than the ES. It only has 16 SU. And it does have a different loadout with the components, only having three size two shield generators. Like Owen said, it does have a top-mounted forward-facing turret so that you can put the pressure on the target as you're chasing them. The EMP and QD drive are designed to stop the target escaping once you've caught up with them. Now, because the Zeus Clipper focuses on hauling cargo, we've decided to lean into the industrial aesthetic. We've covered the exterior with a warning strip paint job, uh, and we've covered the exterior with more technical detail and armor plating. In addition to that, it comes with a remote tractor beam which is mounted on the rear to the side of the ramp to make it easier to haul cargo in and out of the cargo hold. We've also added thrust capacity to the base of the wings. As you can see, there is an absolutely massive rear to it compared to the others. The habitation areas have been massively pushed so that you don't get much space, but we can get way more cargo in. It actually has four times the cargo capacity of the S coming in at 128 SUs of cargo. This one also features three size two shield generators. And like I mentioned, it has a size three tractor beam to make it much easier to get those cargo containers in and out as you're actually playing. What do you think? <laughs> so last year, we introduced the Spirit. And if anyone that may be playing on their live, couple, live the last couple of days might have seen a new ship adding to the verse, the A1. We hope to follow a similar route with the Zeus, where we announce it today, and then in about a year's time, ready to reveal to the public to actually play with. But this isn't just a concept. We're not just going to show you some images. The Zeus is actually in active white, dot, white box development right now. Do you just want to have a look? Yeah. Shall we? Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so as you guys have seen with the Spirit and with the many ships we've released thus far, our ships can, when they're finished, look absolutely gorgeous. But before any of them get to that point, they have to grow through a very specific development process, and this is the first stage in that process. We call this white box. At this point, we've taken the concept, ripped it to shreds, and then reassembled it and plugged it all back together within the editor so that we can get a real good look at what players are gonna see when they finally get this game. At this stage, with the Zeus, we've already ripped out all the thrusters, we've ripped out the landing gear, the turret, the seats, the beds, all of the interior spaces, plugged those guys back in, and we have what you see here. So again, the beginning of the process. At this point, we're able to jump in, start throwing in cargo, interacting with doors, getting in and out of beds, maybe in and out of toilets, and just getting an overall sense of what it feels like to interact with the vehicle. And it is very common that in this stage, we will make some adjustments from the original plan. As an example, on this ship, We've just made the decision to expand the center corridor, add a little bit more space to the rooms. And as a result, that's gonna make it much smoother experience for players to traverse the, in the, the interior of the ship, as well as for AI to traverse the interior of the ship. We've also expanded the main airlock that leads to the enter exit ladder. And up here in the cockpit, we've separated the co-pilot seats a tad bit just to allow players to get in and out a little easier. So with white box, not the prettiest stage in the process, but it is essential that we nail this because it means we'll be able to deliver a beautiful ship that is also extremely fun to play. So that was the RSI Zeus and the three variants. Obviously, as the screen says behind me, it's available now. On the Star Citizen website, you all follow that URL or the QR code behind me. Now, we've just talked about the ship with the longest legacy in the universe. It, it was the first ship of the quantum travel. 
let's change pace a little bit and talk about a much newer ship. We're going to talk about the Cutter. Good little ship. So, obviously, last year, IE, we unveiled the Cutter, and you guys seem to love it. Some interesting information about it. It was actually the single most popular straight-to-flight ready ship we've ever released. You guys really, really liked it. In addition to that, it's actually the best-selling Drake ship to date. But what people didn't know, and we kept a very good guarded secret that no one managed to figure out, no one, that was always meant to be a family of three. Now, what everyone is already familiar with is the base. That's the version that's out in the universe right now that you're already enjoying. What we're going to do today, though, is we're going to talk about the next variant in the family. The Scout. All right, let's just take a minute and sort of enjoy the incredible work that the R team has done pushing this guy out. When the original Scout was, I mean, when the original Cutter was released, it helped us to refine the Drake aesthetic. And now with the variants, we'll be able to add a unique identity to each version. On the Scout, we've decided to replace the main thrusters with a dual thruster system. And you'll see here, we've also added a radar dish to the top, which relates directly to the scanning gameplay that comes with this ship. In addition to that, we have a series of exterior bottom modifications to just push that flavor a little bit further. And you'll see here a transition between the default and the Scout, so you can clearly see the differences. On the interior, we've expanded the rear section of the ship in order to include a dedicated standing scanning station, which will show up here in a second. Along with that, we've also increased the space in the rear to house the larger components that are necessary to support that gameplay. Now, expanding the rear did encroach into the habitation, but we were able to rearrange the components in that room so that nothing was lost in the transition. And on the cockpit, it's the same cockpit that you all know and love from the original cutter. From this view, you'll more clearly see the shift that we had to make in the rear in order to support the gameplay that we're trying to achieve. We're really proud of what the team has done with this ship, and we hope you like the Scout as much as we do. So, obviously, we've just introduced the Scout. What are the main differences between the base? It is a variant, after all. So, the first big difference is the radar. It has a size 2 radar, and to accommodate, to supply that, it comes with a size 2 power plant and a size 2, two, size two cooler. Getting tripped on my own words. As well as the dedicated scan terminal that Ella mentioned earlier. Obviously, as you saw, habitation got a little bit cozier. And unfortunately, it has lost two SU compared to the base. So it only has two SU cargo capacity instead of the three. Now, what we also want to do is talk a little bit more about the future of scanning, if people are interested in hearing about that. <laughs> so what is the future of scanning? We'll touch on it lightly. At the moment, there are two main ways for you to interact with the scanning gameplay loops. The first one's obviously the scan, and the second one's the ping system. Both of these are going to be merged into a single system known as a scan wave. When you send a scan wave out, if you get any successful pings, what will happen is it will immediately populate your HUD with an AR marker, giving you information about what you've been able to scan, as well as starting to give you 
far more interesting information than you get now, rather than just the name of the ship. The underlying system will work on the signature system, similar to what it does today. And there are two main scans. There is the quick scan. The quick scan is just a low version of it. It has a very small impact on your own signal output. So if you want to stay a little bit more covert and potentially not be seen, looking at something you shouldn't, you can use that one instead. The main benefits are small increase to your actual passive detection range, as well as being able to detect things that maybe are a little fainter than you should be able to see. This has a decent amount of cutting through interference, but not phenomenal. The other version is the charge scan. The charge scan is the big scan. Now, this will actually allow you to detect things up to quantum boost range, which is way, way further than the current passive detection range. And not only that, but it'll actually drop a marker allowing you to jump straight to that location for whatever it is that you found. Now, you, you don't want to be jumping in blind. And as I said, it's going to give you way more information than it did before. Some examples, but not limited to this, are things like whatever it is, is it charging a quantum drive? Is it firing? Is the shields generating? Does it have any shields? Is it perhaps charging an EMP? Maybe it's got a snare up trying to catch you. It gives you that additional information so you can make the decision whether you actually want to get to that location. That's just a brief glimpse into the future of scanning and what our vision is for it. Right now, the Cutter Scout is actually in 321. It's available. If you go to that address or go to our website, QR code, it's actually in the universe right now. You don't need to wait for a patch for that. I've been Mark. And I'm Elwin. And before we step off, if you haven't had a chance to get one of these hats, this one in particular is signed by seven members of the ship development team. And if you want it, when, during the meet and greet, if you can tell me the name of the seven people who signed this, all of who are in attendance here, by the way, today, the first person to give me those names gets to keep it. Other than that, thanks, well, guys, and have a great sitcom. Small hit for you. John Crew is one of those names. <laughs> oh, fantastic, guys, everyone. We're going to hand you back to John and Ben. They've got a few more surprises for you. Right. So, as Mark said there, scanning stuff is coming in the future. Um, we didn't show a lot of it. Uh, because it does sort of turn up in some other team's panels, and we didn't want to steal their glory a day early. So I highly recommend sticking around for both the UI one and the flight one tomorrow. So we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Let's talk about the future. So here is a big block of squares that represents our backlog. So each one of these squares is a ship or a vehicle. Uh, all the light blue ones are all the ones we have released to date. All those gray ones are the ones that we have not done yet. The dark blue ones are the ones that will be in your hands by the end of the year. So we have over 200 vehicles for us to support as a vehicle content team. Um, for those of you that are trying to do the maths in your head right now, going, that's, that's the wrong number, this includes uh, every single vehicle that we've ever shown to you, whether that's in a Squadron 42 visual tease or like a, um, a trailer. Some of them are obviously Squadron exclusives. Some of them are going to be NPC exclusives. We still have to support them all. So every vehicle in the game, we have our hands on, and we, we do a lot of work to support them for you. Not the only thing we do. We obviously introduce new content like the Mirai Fury. Uh, we deliver previous promised content. And as you'll see today and tomorrow, we do a lot of gameplay support. So obviously, we help out ships that are like the heroes of the game. Uh, you saw in the resource network uh, engineering uh, panel how that's going to impact ships. Uh, you will have seen, if you've been paying super close attention, uh, some UI elements to do with maps. Stay tuned for that. Uh, we do all that. So we do a lot of work across all aspects of both projects. Uh, and to do all that, we need to do a, a few things. 
Okay, yeah, so John's talked a bit about the backlog. Um, I'm going to kind of take a little bit of, you know, how, how are we going to deliver this? So in April 2023, we actually kicked off a, a new ship team um, in our newest studio, Turbulent, based out of Montreal. Yeah, go Canada. Um, so we've now got um, five artists or vehicle artists, uh, one vehicle designer, one embedded QA tester, and one producer. And that kind of gives us everything we need to start bringing content out of another location. Um, and it also means that we now have kind of reps globally for the vehicle content team in all five of our studios. What's the really nice thing about that is, is it kind of opens up a new pool of a kind of talent that we can pick from. And it should you know, really help us to deliver some more content to the game. And you've actually just seen the first two ships out of that studio. So the Scout variant and the Zeus are both being developed by our Montreal team. Yeah, they're, they're doing, doing great. Um, we're going to look a little bit more in depth at the kind of the art team and, and how we've grown over the years. Um, you can see from this graph, this is our kind of like live numbers of how many vehicle artists we have dedicated to the project. Um, you can see there's a nice trajectory going up. Um, and you know, with more team members, that also means we get kind of like not just more people to throw at stuff, but we get more experience, we get more knowledge. Um, and that's, you know, that allows us to kind of tackle our larger, kind of more complex ships. You will notice there in 2022, there is a, a little dip. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, when, when that happens, that has kind of real consequences on what we are able to do as a team. I think, you know, less people, so less power to put on stuff, but also some of that knowledge leaves us. With that, that leads us to have to make some kind of pretty hard and heavy decisions about what we're working on. And I think most recently and probably most well known is the Bami Merchantman. Yeah. Now, we're going to take a quick look at where we got to with the Merchantman just to show where we were up to before that happened in 2022. <laughs>
So that video shows you know, where we got up to with the merchantman. You can see we finished white box. We were kind of into gray box. Some areas were further than others. And I think one of the best things about working at a company like Cloud Imperium Games is that we're able to be pretty honest and pretty open with our development. One of the biggest questions we get is, what's up with the merchantman? Where is it? Why did it stop? Um, and you know, the merchantman brought a lot of unique challenges to us. It was a completely new art style, something that's very, very different from what we normally do with our human manufacturers. I think you know, we could have paused other ships. We could have moved some of our other artists onto the merchantman. But with the kind of exodus of our kind of senior team in 2022, um, we didn't just lose people. We lost a lot of the knowledge that went into building out that white box and really kind of delivering that art style. What we decided to do at the time is rather than try and rush something out and just get something out to, to get it done, we looked at where we were. And for us, the most important thing was growing our team back up. We wanted to invest in our team and use our seniors and our kind of managers to help get us up to the point where you know, we can tackle multiple large and capital ships at one time. I think the graph previously kind of showed that you know, we've got the head numbers now, and now it's about onboarding our new staff members. It's about skilling them up and getting them to the point. And I would absolutely love to be stood here on the stage and going, yeah, look at the merchant, it's amazing. Like, it's, you know, it's done. Um, but we're not at that point just yet. We do see all the comments. I do see all the, the notes about it. And you know, I absolutely want to get this ship out and done. Um, and you know, we'll, yeah, I just wanted to be open and honest as to where we are up to with the development. Yeah, uh, to, to add to that, it is probably the most question I get asked at any event. And I really want to get done, and get it out for you guys. But we don't want to give you a half-baked thing. We want to give you a really great product that we can all be proud of, and it's delivered alongside gameplay. So let's talk about something else quickly. <laughs> so Squadron 42 vehicles. How many of you have an address of some kind? <laughs> um, right. So we plan to deliver the address alongside the squadron, alongside squadron. And that doesn't mean just the M. We're going to deliver the M, the P, and the K kit all together in one delivery. <laughs> Javelin owners, I'm afraid, you're going to have to wait a bit longer after that, is obviously the bigger ship players can own. Uh, and we have recently looked at what is left to deliver on it. We've got plans. There will be modularity with it. Um, and yeah, that will come after squadron releases. And those of you who also have uh, the Vandal Scythe, Glaive, Blade, after squadron releases, you will also get the updated uh, models as well for that. <laughs> right. Next. OK. No kind of ship panel at a CitizenCon event is kind of done without looking at what's coming up next. Um, previously, we used to do these kind of like silhouettes, um, but we, we kind of always felt they were a little bit predictable. We ended up just making most of them anyway. Um, so, so last year, we changed things up. We, uh, we asked what manufacturer do we want to see uh, make our next large mining ship. Um, and you're going to see more about that at IAE next month. Um, but again, this year, we decided just to mix things up a little bit with how we wanted to deliver this. So you're about to see in a minute a video. Uh, it shows uh, some ships you might recognize. Hopefully, it will show you some that you don't recognize. Um, but feel free to get on Spectrum afterwards. Take a look. Give us a guess at what you think they might be, because um, we'd love to you know, hear your input. And I will just add to that as well. Oh. We aim to deliver everything you see in this video and more in the next 12 months.
I don't know if you noticed, but there was quite a big ship at the end of that video. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just to confirm, that is the Polaris. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've, we've done a lot of talking. Uh, we'll do a bit more talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, OK. Just wanted to touch again on like, yeah, why are we doing an RSI ship? Like, what is with that? So the, the thing about doing another RSI ship is that we've got a really well-established art style for RSI in our, in our universe. Um, and it gives us the ability to kind of skip, or train up newest members of the teams on something that's kind of quite a known element. That is absolutely not the only benefit, though. The way we are like, planning on tackling the Polaris is not tackling it as one ship. But actually, we want to tackle, well, anyone that knows our backlog knows we have a number of large RSI ships on there. And our kind of plan is that we tackle that as a family of ships. We don't just tackle one of them, and then we go off and do something else for six months, a year, come back and do another one, something else, come back and do another one. We want to tackle them all together, one after the other. And what that really allows us to do is just kind of streamline our development process. We're able to. You know, for our more common areas of the ship, we're able to build kits that we're confident in, that we can reuse, and we can make the most out of them. And then that allows us to focus our development time and our efforts, really, on the much more unique and the important and exciting areas of each ship. It, tackling them as a family kind of allows us to expedite their development. We leverage the experience that we've got within the team. And it just allows us to, like I say, streamline everything. So, First up, we've got the Polaris. Next up, we've got the Galaxy. Then we've got the Perseus. And that kind of closes out our, most of our large RSI ships. And then we can you know, see what we want to take on after that. Well, I, I think that's pretty much everything we want to talk about today. Um, however, before we go, we're, we're going to, Torsten's already stolen the, the predictable joke here. So we'll do one last thing to show you guys. So let's have a look at the current state of the Polaris in-engine in its white box state. <laughs> <laughs>